All right, well, uh, thanks again uh, to Marcus Smith and Team Thinking Aloud for allowing us to interview today uh, a distinguished guest. This is Kay David Harrison uh, from Swarthmore College. Uh, Professor Harrison is a linguist, author, and activist for the documentation and preservation of endangered languages. Uh, he uh, is also affiliated with the National Geographic Society. Uh, his research focuses on uh, uh, Turkic languages of Central Siberia, Western Mongolia. He co-starred uh, in Ironbound Films, Emmy-nominated 2008 documentary film, The Linguists. Uh, and he serves also as director of research for the nonprofit organization Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages. Um, Professor Harrison has done field work on endangered languages in Siberia, Mongolia, Paraguay, Chile, Papua New Guinea, India, among other places. Um, and he's a special guest of our BYU Humanities Center, where he's delivering our annual lecture uh, on our theme this year of disappearance. Welcome to BYU, David. Thank you for inviting me here, Matt. It's great to be back. Yeah, well, you were here four or five years ago, is that right? Yes, I was. So, repeat guest at BYU. Well, yeah, well, you come highly recommended. Um, now, you're a linguist um, who has done fieldwork across the globe, which also makes you something of an anthropologist. How did you come to these two areas of, of, of interest, or this kind of blended approach to linguistics? Well, I love languages, I love culture, and so this is a great way to mix them. Linguists tend to study the structures of language, the grammar of language, and anthropologists tend to be more interested in what people know and what they talk about. And so linguistic anthropology is the combination of those two efforts. Uh, I do document languages, I write dictionaries, I write grammatical descriptions of languages, I look at all of the complexity and the patterns. But I also like to hear people talk about uh, hunting stories and <laughs> things that they know, cultural traditions, mythology, yeah. history, whatever they want to talk about. Yeah, was that an interest? I mean, when was this interest born in that aspect of language? Did these were these always sort of your interests as you were kind of a student, or was it really upon graduation that you acquired this particular uh, area of, of, of focused interest? Well, I think like many Americans, I grew up monolingual and didn't really have a chance to learn languages and did not think I had any aptitude for languages until I was an exchange student in my junior year of college. I went to Poland as an exchange student and literally had to learn how to speak if I wanted to eat. <laughs> uh, so it's good I, motivation. Yeah, I was in a full immersion environment and found myself very motivated, but also realized that I had the aptitude and I enjoyed learning languages. And so that was really how it started for me. Okay. You have a, a, a book, you've written a couple of books, um, one of them uh, called The Last Speakers. You talk about uh, your PhD at Yale University and you submitted a, a dissertation with fieldwork in it. And you said that your professors there hadn't seen one of these in a very long time. Um, is fieldwork returning to linguistics today or is it still really kind of a remote practice for linguists? Fortunately, I think the field of linguistics is changing and it's coming back to its roots, which is the idea that you should go out, if you're interested in languages, you should identify a language community that has not been scientifically studied and you should become a part of that community for whatever period of time you can and listen very attentively and make your own bungling attempt to learn the language and allow people to laugh at you when you make mistakes <laughs> and thereby learn and develop some expertise. And that you're right in that that kind of activity was for many years viewed as second rate. Uh, it was not the way to have a, an academic career in linguistics it was considered secondary, and now that has changed, and people who are getting PhDs in linguistics are expected to have spent some time in the field. Um, and I would say beyond the intellectual exercise, living in a community in a cultural immersion situation is incredibly difficult, but it's incredibly rewarding. It is truly a transformative experience in, in my life, and I think other people's lives who have done this kind of work. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to come back and ask you later about the documentary film The Linguists, which is a great chance for people uh, to see actually what some of this work looks like uh, on the ground. Um, for now, let me ask you about you know your 
area of interest in, in going out into the field and studying languages. It's endangered languages. Um, and I mean, you have a very compelling, I think, argument that you make about the impact of languages on how people think and how they, not just how they express themselves, but how they actually think and look at the world. But there's something, I think, really uh, ingeniously counterintuitive about your argument. If you want to make that case, you could do it with English you know, or, or with Spanish or French. But in your case, uh, you do it with languages that are disappearing. You kind of show the effect on the mind through a, 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 an emergent absence. Mm -hmm. How did you come to be interested in endangered as opposed to established languages? Well, Matt, I started by learning uh, some major languages. So, for example, I learned Russian. I lived in the Soviet Union and Russia for several years. And it's a beautiful language, and it has wonderful expressive power that I don't find in English, not in exactly the same way. Anybody who learns a second language immediately begins to appreciate the translation problem. There are entire concepts, ways that knowledge is packaged in that other language that you simply can't easily express in your own language. So it, it's mind expanding in that you have new expressive possibilities. Um, I got interested in endangered languages by accident, but they have this same quality in that they have expressive power, things that can't be translated, and what I call the human knowledge base, which is what people know about the plant, the planet, about plants and animals and just the most wonderful metaphors in different ways of seeing the world. So, for example, I lived in uh, the Republic of Tuva, which is in South Siberia. It's a nomadic people. Um, they have all kinds of wonderful expressions. For example, they, uh, metaphor, they, their metaphor for the past uh, is built on the body. Any, any expression that means yesterday or long ago or um, once upon a time is built on a metaphor for the forehead or the nose. <laughs> and their metaphors for the future um, are built on metaphors for the scapula and the back. So what does that mean? That means that they um, think of the past as being out in front of you physically in space. Huh. And the future is behind you. That's a complete reversal yeah. of our space-time metaphor. And it seems counterintuitive to us, but if you think about it, the past is in front of you because you can see it, it's visible to you. The future is sneaking up on you from behind. You can never see the future. <laughs> and so it's a radically different way of thinking about time and our position in the flow of time. And it really expands your worldview when you realize that and this is what anthropology does for you. You go, you go out and you appreciate another culture's way of thinking, and then you come back and you realize that your own way of thinking is culturally contingent. Mm -hmm. It's not natural uh, in any sense. It's filtered through your own culture. Yeah, that's a fascinating example uh, about, about uh, sort of past and future, sort of imagined, reversed front and behind. Um, in, in, in your book, When Languages Die, you recount some statistics. This might be, and I think, interesting for our listeners to know. Roughly in the world, how many languages are there, and how many are considered endangered languages? Well, I just learned a few minutes ago that uh, there are 110 languages spoken on BYU campus. So <laughs> That's right. So we're sitting in a little bit of a language hotspot right here. Right. That's very impressive. And apparently there are 55 languages that are taught here in the curriculum, mm -hmm. which I also find astonishing and very impressive. Um, globally, um, most people are not aware. If you were to go out and ask people how many languages are there in the world, you would get all kinds of different guesses. The current number of listed languages is 7,120. And you can look in the Ethnologue, which is an online catalog that lists all the world's known languages. Uh, about half of that number, so about 3,500 languages, are considered to be endangered, which means that they may go extinct in this century due to globalization and other socioeconomic pressures. Okay. And I focused on you know the long tail. So the languages, many of the languages I've worked with uh, are very local. They may be spoken only in a single village or only by elderly people in a single village. Right. I've worked on many languages that have uh, six or eight speakers, 20 speakers, 30 speakers, 50 speakers. And coming back to your earlier question, you know, what's the value of that? Yeah. Um, it's not just a different worldview, different expressive powers. 
but it's part of our common human knowledge base. Humans have spent millennia observing the natural world, learning about it, um, experimenting with it, finding medicinal uses for plants, right. finding how the pieces of the ecosystem fit together, which animals are dependent on which plants, and how do humans fit into that picture. So it's a model of sustainable living. It's a model of um, integration with the environment and its knowledge. Uh, for example, if you look at cultures in the Arctic, a very deep knowledge of sea ice and the patterns of animals relating to ice and weather. And so it's really knowledge about how to live on the planet without destroying it. Yeah. And so that should be of obvious value to all of us. And much of that knowledge is only found in small endangered languages. Yeah, and this is one of the things that really strikes me about your book, When Languages Die. Uh, you make a very, uh, I think, persuasive case, a uh, compelling case, uh, about the sophisticated understanding of languages where there isn't even writing. And we attach, you know, sophistication to written systems, you know, that's how we transmit knowledge. And your point is, well, actually, a lot of these languages have no writing system, and yet they've got incredible detail and subtlety about how they you know, engage the world. And this detail can be expressed about plants and animals or ice, or even in the ways that they count uh, or imagine future and past. I found that really uh, very provocative. Well, I hope... I hope it is provocative, and um, Matt, I know you're a literary scholar, so I want to challenge just a little bit our literacy bias. Mm -hmm. um, we all come from highly literate cultures, so we tend to think of literacy as essential to progress, to civilization. We look at cultures that are illiterate as having a kind of social deficit, something they should quickly get over, they should hurry up and adopt writing and catch up with our level. But we often don't think of that as a trade-off. So there are things that people can do in oral cultures with their minds that we simply don't know how it's done. Uh, I had the pleasure of working in, in Siberia with an epic storyteller. And I write about him in my book, When Languages Die. Um, he had probably a fourth or fifth grade education, was um, marginally literate, but he had memorized 10,000 lines of an epic tale and could recite it over a period of days. I don't even memorize telephone numbers anymore. <laughs> so I can't even fathom how does one go about memorizing 10,000 lines of an epic tale. Yeah. It's miraculous. Yeah. So there are things uh, in having to do with the social distribution of information, the transmission mm -hmm. of vast bodies of knowledge and information in purely oral cultures that look mysterious to us. We don't know how they're done. And so it is a trade-off. When cultures adopt writing, they have the ability to outsource information onto the environment. You no longer have to memorize telephone numbers. You just program them into your phone. <laughs> uh, you no longer have right. to memorize long bodies of text. But you've lost something, too. You've become mentally dependent on these, these external um, sources. Yeah. No, it's it's a it's a it's a it's really interesting. I mean, this and, you, and again, you make this point. I think really persuasively in your book. Uh, even a literary scholar like me who can concede that point. Yeah, it, actually, it's an excellent point. Um, are there more languages dying today than say a half century ago? I mean, is 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 language endangerment, language death? Is that uh, an emerging phenomenon, or is it just simply now, as it's been for a very long time? And 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 what are some of the factors that lead to language extinction? It's a little hard to spot or to quantify a trend when you're living in it. And so we are living in the midst of a language extinction crisis right now. It's a little bit difficult to say whether this, the pace is faster now than it was 100 or 500 years ago mm -hmm. or whether it's accelerating. There's a lot of facts that are hard to verify. People like to say, for example, it's commonly said that a language goes extinct every two or three weeks. That's really impossible to verify that. Uh, but we are in a state where about half the world's languages are endangered. And I've personally worked with people who were among the very last speakers of their languages. So it's a real phenomenon. It's not imaginary. Whether it's more severe now than at some prior point in history, very hard to say, because in earlier human history, 
no languages were written down, and so right. most languages could have come and gone and not left any trace in the archaeological record, except for the few that did. But writing is a fairly recent technology in, in human history. Yeah, sure. So um, it's hard to say. But there are um, people now living in, in, in the U.S. Uh, who, are last, who are truly last speakers of their languages. Yeah. You know, I, I, one of my areas of interest is Scotland, and I'm familiar, you know, um, with you know, Scotland is a, is a trilingual nation, English, obviously, but also Scots, which is some variant of, you know, some sort of medieval version of, of English, and then uh, Gaelic, Scots Gaelic. And, and, and uh, there are heritage languages and efforts to preserve. You work with languages that are, that are really, really endangered, I mean, really on the verge of extinction. How often do you see or do we know of the reversal of near extinction? Once it gets to be just a few dozen speakers, is it reversible? Or at that point, is it really a matter of time only until the last speakers die? I don't think there are any hopeless cases. And I have examples of languages that have only a single fluent speaker that have undertaken a strategic language revitalization effort. Wow. And so... It really is up to the community. If they decide they want to save their language, they can do new things with it. I'm thinking about the Siletz language, which is spoken in the state of Oregon. There's one fluent speaker. Uh, his name is Bud Lane. He conducts language revitalization classes for the younger members of the community, and they are learning some of the language. And not only are they learning it, but they're doing things like text messaging in the language. <laughs> and they're having debates about whether they're going to borrow words like computer, or are they going to invent a Siletz word that means brain in a box? Mm. So even with what looks like a dire scenario with one fluent speaker and a few learners, you can have this expansion of the language into social media, into texting. You can have these debates about new terminology in the language. So languages are also resilient, and that's the flip side of the story. I don't want to focus just on language extinction, though we are in a language extinction crisis. There's also a fascinating grassroots global movement for language revitalization that's happening all around us, including places in the U.S. That sounds, that's a, that's a very hopeful story um, and heartening, really, to hear. Um, but what about those who would make kind of the, the contrary case and say, well, okay, languages go extinct sometimes, that's too bad, but when they go extinct, can't that be good for the language speakers? Does it mean they're assimilating to larger, more flourishing culture? Doesn't it provide more access to education, better jobs? What's your response to that kind of, you know, sort of counter argument to the one that you make? Yeah, there are a couple of interesting counter arguments, and I've heard them made occasionally even by people who speak endangered languages, which mm. is the argument that adopting English or a major global language represents progress and economic opportunity because those languages dominate. Knowing a Siletz or Scottish Gaelic is not going to get you ahead. Um, there's also the social Darwinism argument that those languages must somehow be less suited to the modern world, and therefore it's a natural process that they should disappear and give way to the more technologically advanced languages. So I can give counterexamples to both of those. Um, any language uh, can be adapted rapidly by its speakers to talk about whatever they need to talk about, um, including f um, theoretical physics or anything <laughs> like that. Languages yeah. constantly change. They constantly borrow or coin new words. Yeah. Um, so there's no problem with that. Um, as for economic progress, uh, there's no reason why people can't be bilingual, and so it's a bit of a false choice to say that people have to give up, uh, say, Zapotec uh, if they're living in me southern Mexico and speak only Spanish, when in fact they can perfectly well be bilingual. And there's a lot of research coming out of psychology now that shows that the bilingual brain is smarter. It has more mm -hmm. of what's called the cognitive reserve, which means that bilingual people perform better on certain cognitive tasks unrelated to language mm -hmm. than people who only have one language in their brain. So having two languages in your brain exercises your brain. Uh, there's also a, a lesser pr probability of getting Alzheimer's among <laughs> bilingual populations. Right. And so being bilingual right. yeah. is good for you yeah. um, cognitively and physically. Yeah. And so there's no reason why people can't be bilingual. So it's a little bit of a false choice to say that they should give up a heritage language in order to uh, join the global community. They can do both. 
Yeah, sure. And I've actually heard uh, some stories about this. A professor colleague at BYU has talked about the impact of learning two languages on the, on the capacity to do certain other cognitive operations, like play chess, for example. Uh, there are lots of cases like this. Um, let me ask you about the, the film that was made uh, about your work, The Linguists, you and a colleague. It, it, it shows you sort of on location around the world. Um, how did this even come about? I mean, nobody yet at National Geographic has approached me about my work. <laughs> so I'm offended by this greatly, by the way. Uh, how did this happen for you? I got a call from two filmmakers, um, and they had initially been inspired by the loss of Yiddish as a heritage language in their own families. They're both um, New York Jewish families, so they had Yiddish spoken in their parents' and grandparents' generation. They don't speak it at all. They understood this as a kind of loss of something. So they got the idea, and then they had the idea that they were going to call up um, they, they told me that they decided to call up the only linguist they knew, so they called up Noam Chomsky, <laughs> uh, who's a very famous linguist and yes. professor at MIT, and uh -huh. said something like, we're planning to make a film about dying languages, and he said something encouraging to them. And then I think they talked to several other linguists and wanted to come along on field expeditions, and for whatever reason, um, the other people did not agree to do that, and I immediately agreed because I think you have to communicate these issues to a broader audience. Mm -hmm. And so um, Daniel Miller and, and Seth Kramer, who made the film, they came along with me and Greg Anderson, my linguist um, research partner. Uh, we took them to a very remote place in Siberia, <laughs> uh, a place we had not been before. We had heard about this language. We did not know at the time we went there if there were any speakers left at all. So there was this element of suspense. Are we going to find speakers or maybe not? Uh, the first speaker we found was deaf. And so even though she could speak the language, she right. ultimately did not speak with us. Uh, and then we had various other adventures and misadventures. And eventually <laughs> our driver, who had been driving us around the various villages trying to look for speakers, suddenly came out and said, oh, I, I speak the language. But I was right. just didn't, you know, I've been... He had basically been made fun of his whole life for being a speaker of this language and a member of this ethnic group, and so he had a feeling of sh internalized shame mm -hmm. about it. And so, um, but once he once we broke through uh, with him, then we began we began to meet the other speakers, and they were very generous. Uh, it's a language called Chu Lim. It has eight speakers left, probably mm -hmm. less than that now. They are hunter-gatherers. They have a very deep knowledge of the f Siberian forest environment and wonderful stories about hunting bears and just a, a beautiful, complex culture that is uh, collapsing. Um, and so we were able to do what we call a salvage documentation, which is basically recording what's left and what's available. Okay. The, the documentary captures, I think, that your experience there uh, with those speakers of Chulim, I think, really, really well. And you see some of the struggles about trying to talk with people who uh, are uh, elderly, uh, hard of hearing, especially here. Then, um, How long did this take to film? Because it's not just a film set there with one expedition. There are several expeditions. So how long was it to assemble the material for the film? Well, more importantly, the funding for the film. Yeah, so okay, we did the Siberian question. expedition, and then the filmmakers, um, uh, Dan and Seth, they had to spend, I think they spent about two years uh, trying to raise the funds, and they eventually got a National Science Foundation grant, and then they came back to us and said, okay, we've got the funding, uh, we want to go to some other locations, and we want some variety because we want to show this as a global problem. So. After Siberia, we went to India, to the Himalayas, to look at, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, we went to, in, to Eastern India to look at a small language there. Uh, we then went to Bolivia up in the Andes to look at a language there. And there's also footage from a Native American language, Chimahuevi, which is spoken by one person in Arizona. And so you get this sense that there's a global phenomenon and you get these very personal human stories in different locations about people's struggle to hang on to their cultural heritage. Yeah. Um, 
and it's a, and it's a very good film. I mean, people who have not seen it should look it up. Uh, who are interested in languages? It's very, very interesting. Um, we got about five minutes or so, maybe four minutes or so. I'm wondering, um, you know, a project like yours, the work that you do, it does have a strong theoretical dimension. You know, pointing out to things the relation between language and human understanding, but there's also kind of a practical dimension. I mean, there's something of a cause to what you're doing. You consider or you will consider your work to have been successful if what? Mm. Well, language is unique to humans. There are other species that have rudimentary symbolic communication systems like birdsong or other signaling systems. Um, and then there's dolphins that they're doing something intelligent, but mm -hmm. we don't know what. Yeah. Um, but humans are the only species that have language and language is incredibly complex. It's infinitely creative and generative. You can constantly say new things that have never been said before in the history of the language. And it's also incredibly diverse. So it really is the hallmark intellectual property of our species, um, more than even tool use, I would say, although language use is a kind of tool yeah, use. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and so it's something that makes us fundamentally human. It is incredibly diverse. Languages, including sign languages, which are done in a, in a different modality, all have incredible complexity, and yet they are very different from each other. And we don't even know yet what the full range of variation that's possible because we don't have a scientific documentation of more than maybe 10% of the world's languages to even begin to know how to compare them or how they um, array themselves along perhaps a scale of complexity or difference or similarity. And so it's a very exciting time to be in linguistics and documenting the world's languages. Uh, it's also, there's a sense of urgency because many of the languages are on the brink of disappearing and haven't yet been documented or recorded. And I think it speaks to core humanistic values. Yeah. You know, if we value intellectual diversity, different ways of thinking about things, different types of concepts, creativity, poetry, storytelling, things that make us human, it's the fullest expression of that is not, uh, does not find itself exclusively in English or some other language. It finds itself in all 7,000 languages. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I've got to say, I'm not a linguist, uh, but you know, your work almost persuades me to try to become one. It's very, very interesting and really, I think, important work. And it's a real pleasure to have you at BYU. Thank you very much, Professor Harrison. Thank you. Thank you.